can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, this is part of the Israel Business Leader Series, other companies that you should check out and people that we've had on. They interviewed, uh, that have been interviewed, uh, Yossi Vardy, who's been involved in the Israeli tech scene for over 50 years, Kendigo, which is a fast-growing agency, the Mobileye journey being acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion, and Yuri Adoni uh, talks about his book, The Unstoppable Startup. So check that out. And the episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we help B2B businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients by helping you run your podcast. So, you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships and having a podcast has been the best thing for me to give to my best relationships, have them on a platform to talk about what they're working on and how they're changing the world. Uh, like uh, Gal is. So if you have questions about starting a podcast, um, go to rise25.com. We've been doing it for over 10 years at this point. Um, it's been the best thing I've ever done. So um, I also want to thank you to Shom Levy and Extra Mind for introducing me to today's guest. We have Gal Solomon, a CEO and founder of Clue, which you just heard about. Um, it uses artificial intelligence and predictive analytics to improve the outcome of critically ill patients. Basically, what this means, Gal, is it helps doctors predict who needs life or death medical care before they actually need it a lot of times. So prior to founding Clue, he founded uh, Sansa Security and led the company as CEO for the inception until um, 2010. He then served as active chairman until the acquisition of Arm. And during this time, he was venture partner at Patango uh, Venture Capital, and he served in multiple positions in at Intel and DSP Communications. Gal, thanks for joining me. Really appreciate it. Um, one of the inspirations uh, behind this is your mom. That's correct. Uh, you know, I've been involved in many, um, many types of technology across different kinds of companies in different areas. And, you know, for someone which basically manage different teams, different companies, and different flavors, you're coming to the point that you're working very, very hard, you know, to take the company from being a dream to being reality. And, you know, most of the companies are being acquired. And I went to this journey as well. And then, you know, after uh, two companies which I managed and, and, and sold, um, I moved to the, to the other side of the table, which is uh, becoming investors um, and with the largest VC here in Israel. And, and unfortunately, during this time uh, that I moved, you know, my mother passed away. Hmm. And she passed away for no reason. Absolutely no reason. I mean, yes, she was a cancer. I mean, she had a cancer, but she didn't die from cancer. She died from, um, from the fact that the medical team didn't put attention to the small details. They didn't react in time. They didn't know what they had. And like in two days, she's gone. And, 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 that, and that was so sad because you're coming and said, you know, you're going to the hospital could, to get a treatment. You believe that, you know, in two, three days, you're going to be out going back to your home. And then you're dying for nothing. And, and I stated to myself very clearly that it's about time that I will do something really different, something which, which need to be matter. It's not another gadget, it's not another publication, it's not another PC, mobile phone, whatever. I mean, I, and I've done tons of those. But I didn't done anything which is significant. And we want to make an impact. We want to leave something behind us. And, and, and I took this case and, and I said, there is no way in the world that technology cannot help. And then I started this, this journey. I took a friend, uh, Victor, which is working with me here, which used to be my VP R&D in my previous company. And I said to him, let's build a company that will save 
we serve life. Mm. And again, we didn't know, we didn't knew anything about healthcare. We didn't knew anything about ICU. We didn't know anything about, you know, what is acute patients, what is intensive care. And obviously we didn't done anything about COVID because COVID just come, just came in the last couple of months. But we said, guys, we know what is, what is state, how we can build the algorithm, and how we can build a model that can help to understand what's going on. And, and together with a very small group of people is always starting, we started in my garage, as always. And we came and said, let's look for a place that you have enough data, because without data you can't do anything. And let's build a model that helps to manage patient based on models in the area of artificial intelligence. This is how we started. So the only place that you had the data, in the high density data, uh, was in the critical care area. So we took a critical care doc, very promising one, touched it to the team and said, okay, let's go and build a system that can save life. And this is exactly what we're doing mm -hmm. here in Clue. And I'm here not because of the next exit. I'm here to make an impact. And we're here to make a company, a large and successful company, because by the end of the day, Jeremy, you and I can make mistakes. And we're probably doing, you know, tons of mistakes every day. But when the medical teams are making mistakes, that can be tragedy here. And this, uh, that was what happened to me. Yeah. And, and I'm coming and said, look, from being here almost five years, spending my time in different healthcare system, I can see in which type of pressure the medical team is working. They can just what is happening right now, right now with COVID-19, which the medical team is working like with ongoing shifts. So for 18 hours, 19 hours a day, this is impossible. I mean, the amount of pressure, the amount of responsibility they have, I mean, you must do, and, 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 and you don't have enough people, you don't have enough doctors, you don't have enough nurses, and, 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 and you need to prioritize. And, and this COVID-19 kind of stuff, no one really can understand how it was created, how it's working. You don't have one case which is exactly like the other case. Every case is completely different. Yeah. And, and here, the only place that I believe that technology can help is in those kind of places. And, and, and I believe that we're not coming to replace the medical team because this, those are the ones that need to take a decision. We're here to advise them what to do because if I will tell you what will be the future of this patient or what will happen with him in the next five hours, I guess that you can do a lot thing with this kind of element because you need to remember two types of things that medicine is everything about evidence and 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 in every med school around the world the the sentence about evidence-based medicine is created and this is the bible the problem that we have in icu that when you have an evidence it's already too late and when you have a clinical sign that something is going to happen, you probably miss the train already. And this is why we are building a solution which will help to predict. We want to be proactive rather than be reactive. Because if we're going to be reactive, we will continue to lose patients. We need to make the early intervention because you have tons of papers around Early intervention equal to better outcome, and this is what we're trying to do here. Yeah. First of all, um, God, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom. You know, that's it's tragic, and you went about to really solve a really big issue and problem. And I can see, you know, originally I was going to say, well, where, how did you choose where to go? And it sounds like, well, the intensive care has the most amount of data that they're capturing from patients. So that makes it the easiest in the beginning to serve that particular unit. So I could totally see that. Um, 
And I want to talk about the FDA in a second, but you know, it's, it's not easy to break into the medical field with new solutions. You know, um, they, like you said, doctors and facilities want to see evidence. They want to see, has this been proven? How is this proven? Um, and then you said, well, we had no experience with this. How did you break into, and, and right now I saw like on your advisory board and your you know, board of directors, you have people from Harvard, you have people from University of Chicago, you have people from all over the United States and Israel um, working on this. How did you get these people on board and break into like the first place to test this? So as always, you're coming with a vision and we're using, you know, the Israeli word chutzpah, which is, I mean, don't be shy. <laughs> And I'm using whatever I can. I'm using, you know, every single connection. And, and, and when we started, it was clear that we need to build the present. We need to build, you know, the notion that we know what we're doing, which we didn't know. I mean, to be quite honest, I mean, we came with idea that was changed, you know, every single day it was changed like 20 times. Uh, but then when we started to build the structure of our boards, including guys from Harvard, from, um, um, from Chicago, from Stanford, from, uh, from Emory, uh, from Mayo Clinic, uh, you're always coming with a dream. You're always coming with a passion about guys that want to make a change, help me to make a change. And then, you know, as you said, and this is, this is still true, you know, in medicals, I mean, it's not enough to come and with whistles and whispered. I mean, you need to come with evidence. And we started, you know, on our journey with the, with the clinical study that we have done with Mayo Clinic, one of the best names that exist, which they didn't believe in anything that we have said to them. We didn't yeah, I it. totally see that. Hey, we have this thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, guys, you want to play with technology, fine. I mean, <laughs> the kids will come and play in front of us. But after 1,400 patients, which you can see how models, mathematical complex model like AI model, can predict deterioration hours before the team really understood that something is going to happen then it's not, a tear, it's not a story anymore. It's reality. What did you do at Mayo Clinic when you went in? So, so we done a clinical study uh, with a very uh, gifted team, which uh, led by two professors, Vitaly Hiroshevitz and Brian Pickering. I mean, those are wonderful guys. Um, that it was a pleasure to work with them. And, and we came to them and said, guys, we have um, a way, we have a method that we can predict one of the killer, one of the number one killer in the ICU, which is sepsis. Sepsis is, is, is a nickname for infections. With Widespread infection, yeah. And no one, you know, everyone is talking about sepsis over the last, what, 15 years, 16 years? No one have a solution for that. And people still dying because of sepsis. So we came to that with this idea and they said, I mean, guys, I mean, many, many guys, many groups, I mean, bigger than you, more gifted like you, with more budget, have tried that so many times. I mean, why to bother? And we said, guys, I mean, I mean, give us a chance. I mean, i done several things in my life, not in healthcare or in other places, and I, and I was successful. And you know, like after 20 iteration, so the guy came and said, okay, you know what? I mean, fine. I mean, let's, let's go with that. I can tell you that it's not going to go. It's, I mean, you're wasting your time. And we have done a, a clinical trial with those guys, and we published that. And we showed clearly evidence around, you know, there is no doubt that you can predict who's going to be deteriorating due to sepsis from being septic to be septic shock. And that was the starting point. 
over the time, we had more and more complication. Every complication needs to come to a point that it needs to go to the uh, regulation pass. It's FDA need to approve that. And, and it's a long process. It's taking a lot of time, a lot of energy. You need to have a very healthy budget for do that because it's not just you know submitting papers. You need to do that over multiple institution, multiple demographics, multiple, multiple ethnic groups. And the FDA folks are very true. They are very, very specific. And this is, this is their job. Now, how do you, um, and we'll talk about COVID in a second, but um, you know, from the standpoint of the sepsis, um, what do the doctors see on the screen? You know, so, you know, you're plugging away, you're taking all these metrics and allowing the doctor to make a decision, a predictive, you know, what's going to happen to the patient. What does the doctor see as a, like an alert that comes on? What, what do they see so that they can act um, on that data? So if anyone's listening, we're looking at a dashboard here. Um, and this is, so this is what the doctors see. So this is basically, uh, this is the skeleton from uh, one of the installations that we have. Uh, which is under IRB uh, in uh, UMass Memorial at Boston, at Worcester in Boston. Yeah. This is a network of hospital which is built from seven different ICUs. So what you're seeing is obviously the technology is behind the scene. So what you're seeing here is the different units that you can go and see how many patients, what are their condition. So here we're in the six university units in one of the hospitals in Worcester, uh, you can see how many patients. Uh, you can see that this patient is, is in good condition. Is probably going to be moved to step-down units. You, but you can see that this patient is going to be deteriorating. And the type of deterioration here is hemodynamic instability. It can be hemodynamic, can be respiratory failure, can be any other. And, and, and what you're seeing here also, it's... The second one uh, 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 screen, which allowed you to understand exactly how many patients like that you have and in, in which location they are located. Also, everything that you're running, you're running from here. So this is a, a hemodynamic instability. This is a respiratory failure. Here you can see all the protocols which allowed you basically to deal with best practices, which means that I can win a patient from ventilator, from medication, for anything. Everything is captured here using the algorithm that we have. And the most important thing, this is the current condition of this patient, which you can see hundreds of different parameters that were manage and manipulate and recalculate every single minute uh, that you can explain why we believe that this patient is on the screen. So, a solution like that would look exactly like that, that you will have hmm. the EMO screen, that you're putting the ordering, you have the MRI screen, you have the video that you can do zoom in, zoom out on every single patient, and you have the clue screen, which describe you the network, the doctor, and the patients. Hmm. And this is the six screen button station that we're talking about. Yeah, I want to point out, God, that, um, you know, with the patient that's a high risk deteriorating, you know, I was, I was watching one of the videos um, on, on Clue. And by the way, if you want to check it out, you can go to cluemed.com and check out what they're doing. But what's interesting is the person or the patient may appear totally fine at the time. Um, and that's, that's a key. It's not like buzzers are going off and they're going into some type of, they're having issues currently. They could look totally normal. And, but it's showing high risk, meaning, like you said, it's being proactive instead of reactive. The whole idea here is to provide you an information that you don't know. If I'm going to tell you that tomorrow morning you will have a rain and tomorrow morning you're going out and you have rain, I mean, I didn't tell you anything. But if you're going outside of your home and you have a very clear sky and the, and the, and and, and, and everything look very normal. And I will tell you that, look, in three hours, you will have a massive rain here. You will come and say to me, are you joking me? I mean, what's the matter with you? So this is the type of thing that we're saying to you. 
because the monitor that you're currently seeing on, on the patient doesn't tell you anything because it's kept here like three minutes. Right. It's a rolling three minutes capture and and it will not indicate anything about the future because you know this is this is the nature of the prediction. I mean you don't have any clinical sign. Every everything looks normal. Your heart rate is okay, your blood pressure, your saturation, your pulse, your cardiac output, everything you know is with with the normal. But we will tell you that storm is coming. And the storm will come from this source, and this is how the trajectory, and this is what will happen here. So it's better that you will start act upon, you know, what you're seeing here and start to dealing with the patient. And you can save lives because you have time to make an intervention and to save lives. And this is the heart of the technology that we're bringing. Yeah. And Gal, you know, you start off with like, wanting to solve this big issue in intensive care, which is sepsis. Obviously, <clears throat> with COVID coming, was there any type of shift you needed to make in the technology sure. so to, to account for that? Or was it built, you know, it would account for the same type of issues as sepsis to COVID? So in the COVID space, I mean, most of the models that was played was the hemodynamic and the respiratory failure. Bear in mind that most of the COVID patients have a respiratory issues. And we're the only one that work over many years on respiratory um, models in order to predict when the patient will come to the situation that he need to be intubated. So what we have done over there is we have created the system that can come and not buzz right now that you have a situation, you will have a situation in a couple of hours. And therefore you need to be act upon what is the protocol you, is telling you to do. And, and, and by doing that, you're pretty much focused the medical team. Coming and said, okay, in this patient, we need to do one, two, three, four, in this patient, we need to do six, five, nine, and this one, something else. And we're providing you a tools that we have, for, that we have developed internally that you can put every single protocol around, you know, the different risks that you have, including what the nurse need to do, what the physician need to do, you know, step by step in a way that you're not going to miss anything. And the fact that it's running from isolated environment, that you don't really attach to, uh, uh, to the patient over there, it's give you a quiet zone that you can think and you can act and you can build the product or you can build the protocol around, you know, what you have thinking. And, 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 you know, even here, it's a lot of cut and try because, you know, I mean, in COVID, we still have so many unknowns and this is, this is the one that we're dealing with currently. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to talk about you get heat from people not telling enough people that it's FDA cleared. Um, so uh, I was reading an article at the Times of Israel about, it was called uh, FDA cleared Israeli tech to warn doctors before COVID-19 patients deteriorate. Um, talk about the FDA process. Um, you know, how hard is it? It's hard. I mean, we got the FDA clearance in the EUA part. Uh, the EUA definitely helped us basically to expedite because the sense of urgency is, exists. And uh, we have started our dialogue with the FDA team, uh, I think, uh, two years ago. And, and, and bear in mind that FDA started, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, again, I'm not like 20 years in healthcare, but you know, from talking to guys and read a lot of stuff, uh, FDA came from the medication, from pharma. This is how everything was started. Was That's what it is, yeah, it's Food and Drug Administration, yeah. Correct. And then it was like many years ago, you started to have a medical devices came. And then they need to spread and really understand what is medical devices because their core expertise was farming. And then, 
you know, a couple of years ago, they have uh, coming the new boy to the neighbor, which is saying digital health. And within digital health, you have AI. And right now, <laughs> the guys which, you know, right. came from Pharma need to understand what this mathematical model look like. Uh, so we met a very, ter- I mean, very, very good teams over there. And we, we moved and we worked with the multiple teams in the FDA because cardiovascular is one team. Respiratory is another team. You know, low risk is another thing. Glue everything. I mean, I mean, you're not working with a single point of contact, although we have one single point of contact, but you need to coordinate everything. And, and it took some time. And it took some time because it, you have a learning curve. And, 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 and it's a complex kind of thing. When you have hundreds data points, which is entered to some big system, and by the end of the day, you have a black box that doesn't tell you anything, you'll have only results, then you're kind of coming and said, what's the matter? What is the trick here? So it took a lot of time to really explain what is AI, what is machine learning, what is deep learning, what is classifiers, uh, 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 what is anomaly detections? Um, that was part was done in our uh, physician, and we're employed here a very big team of medical doctors. And the second one is coming with a very gifted team that we have in Clue, which is mathematicians. This is how we're building everything. And the Clue layer is the software guy that we have here, but. It's not enough to go and show the guys from the FDA uh, uh, the dashboard. They want to understand what's in it for them uh, and how they can save life. Because, you know, you need to remember that by the end of the day, FDA here is to protect the patient, is to make sure that you're not compromised anything around the patients. And, and, and this is a process. It's a long process. It's yeah. a lot of time. It's a lot of, you know, going back and forth, and they have a lot of questions which you need to answer. And it's a very uh, iterative kind of process, but the EUA definitely gave us a very fast uh, a road to start moving. And, 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 you know, for good and bad, that was to our benefit. Yeah. I want to talk about adoption, right? Um, you know, if anyone listening has a company, they're a founder, they're an entrepreneur, adoption, you know, is not always easy. And now we're talking about adoption in major medical facilities. Um, I'm curious, like, you know, Mayo Clinic's like, yeah, go play around. You're probably not going to solve anything. Good luck. Um, going to the next facilities, what were some of the objections that you get that you had to push through before they would actually come in and implement it? So, you know, I was a little bit frustrated, you know, uh, six months ago. Uh, And part of the frustration that I have, you know, I came from a totally different environment, totally different industry, which was consumer electronics. This is what I've done over the last 20 something years. The beauty about the consumer electronic business that you have an owner's you have sense of urgency, you have, you know, clear timelines. And this is a very, very fast environment, which is very competitive. Healthcare is working differently. Uh, to some extent, it's very, very slow. It's the opposite. Hours. Yeah. Doesn't move so fast. <laughs> very, I mean, they're not very thrilled about technology. They are looking for service. They are looking for patient safety. Uh, they are not really, you know, they are not going to buy in, you know, buzzword around AIs or anything else unless they can see proof. Like how many clinical studies this is, does this have or something like that, right? We need yeah. to run and we were, we're continuing to run more and more clinical studies. So it's probably never will end. I mean, and you need to have millions of millions of dollars to to spend around those clinical trials, because 
every time that you have a model, you need to you need to build it. You need to qualify. It, you need to test it. Bear in mind that FDA is not allowed us basically to continue to improve the model, unlike yeah. other industries. Uh, so models around self-learning are not going to be part of this kind of technology, simply because of the basic fact that FDA wants to approve every single model, which means that major part of our elements is going to be attached to every version that we have. We need to pre-submit, submit, get approval, install. And this is taking time. So going back to your question, you were talking about... Yeah, very, objections, yeah. Not the most fast adaptation kind of industries or, I mean, healthcare by itself, they have their concern. They have their own, you know, obstacles about, you know, adapting new technology. Yeah. Uh, There's so many course, obstacles, Gal, because first you have to get it in to the hospitals. Then you have to get the staff to use it. I mean, that's a whole nother thing. Then, and then you have another element, which are becoming very, very important, especially those days, which is, you know, okay, you proved, you proved to me that clinically you're working fine. But then, you know, the decision maker is becoming right now the CFO. And the CFO coming and said to you, okay, you're clinically okay, but how you can help me to either save money or to generate more revenue? So as you probably today, you know, you can't come with a solution like that unless you can have mm. financial equation, yeah. very clear, very described, in a way that the CFO can come and said, okay, I have this check mark that I need to fill it, but I mm. need to improve my financial results. Especially those days with healthcare providers are losing millions over millions of dollars. I mean, the equation need to be not just the clinical part, the equation mm. need to include also the financial part. Mm. So, so how so, do you include that part? Is it then have to do with something with, well, it's more likely to get it approved by insurance because we've proved with this data or how do you, you know, incorporate the financial piece? Because that, that makes perfect sense. And I wasn't even in including that piece. So the financial one is, 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 is very, very well described from one hand, but it's complicated from the other hand because you need to remember that ICUs, intensive care units, are not stained by itself. It's either part of the OR, part of the surgical activities, or part of any other, which means that you need to prove is that given your DRG, given your, your bundle payment that you're, get, that you're uh, getting from the payer, you need to make sure that you're, that you're within the limits that the, that the payer is providing you. If you want to improve, you need to perform much better because if your DRG covered like four days in the hospital, but after three days, the patient is stable enough uh, to go home, that means you have saved one day that you, can say, that you can sell the same bed for more patients. Right. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying here to increase efficiency, increasing throughput. Right, right. It means that on a given resources that you have, the same amount of bed, same amount of nurses, the same amount of doctor, you will see more patients. Yeah. This is how it's going to be. Oh, it's interesting. It's not enough to save lives anymore. You, 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 no, you, no, you got to no. have a financial incentive um, reason too. Have. You must have. I mean, yeah. guys, not, let's not hiding between the bushes. I mean, the financial right. equation is important as the clinical part. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. It's kind of like, it's not the best analogy, Gal, but when, when I was researching Clue, um, I was kind of thinking, it's kind of when I first started using Waze. I was like, I know a better way. Okay. I know the shortcuts and I would plug in Waze and Waze was always right. If I went against Waze, it didn't matter. I was wrong, even though I thought I knew the shortcuts and I feel like it's the same with Clue. So like, listen, I can see the doctor, like, I see everything, I know what Clue says, but listen, here's my experience and you have this other dis 
the data that you sometimes as a human can't see because we're not making a million permutations of these calculations. So it's kind of when I started researching, that's the, what I thought of, like I now never go against waves, you know, because of that. That's exactly what we thought. And, you know, we had a lot of discussion about clue is the medical part of ways. Right. Is guide us, what do you think we should do? And, and, and keep in mind a couple of things. One, you have a very, very gifted doctors, which are devoted their life to deal with patients. But those guys, as we said, they're under pressure. They have a lot of priority. They have a lot of patients. But more so, I mean, you know, you have weekends. You have nights. You have holidays. That you don't have the best team 24 hours. You don't have 24-7. And this is basically the combination that we're providing because you have the safety net, which allowed you to use, you know, even student, even, you know, um, um, medical teams, which are not really, uh, uh, you know, have tons of experience because yeah. you have this, this type of technology that can help you to understand yeah. what's going on. But beside that, it will help you basically to navigate where to go. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about this, about this technology, not even for intensive care, but I'm hoping that you, you prove this out, which you have with the intensive care, but for actual everyday human beings walking around, because we hear of people, friends who just dropped out of a heart attack, people who dropped out of a stroke, and there was no warning sign. So I'm hoping at some point you have some technology that will warn people of those things. Um, so that they don't just drop in the middle of their bathroom um, and no one had a clue. You know what I mean? So I guess that's why you name it Clue, Clue Med. But um, so I'm hoping for those days. But you mentioned the, the team, you know, everyone's functioning as a team and assembling your team. Your team, when I was doing research, looks um, outstanding. And I'm wondering, you know, all these people probably have tons of opportunities. They could, they could do a million different things. You have professors, you have you know, MDs, you have uh, an amazing team um, and you have to come in and sell the vision to them to work on this new thing years ago. Uh, Clue, who is the hardest to convince? Doctors. Doctors. Yeah, medical doctors are, you know. Who specifically very like from hard. your team that you had to go to and, and basically... Uh, I mean, it was starting from uh, uh, John Halamka, which is great guy. I mean, it's really friend. John uh, was the CEO of Beth Israel in Boston. Right now, he's the president of Mayo Digital. And but I think every every single person was, you know, we came with a story, and I said, "Fine, guys." I heard, you know, many many stories around that. I'm not mm -hmm. interested to uh, spend more time on another fairy tale. And- uh, They're jaded. I think the level of, how to put it this way, they are not really, you know, technology is nice, but you know, guys, we have went to medical school. We have like 30 years of experience. How come, you know, software algorithm can tell us something that we don't know? It's impossible, and and I think thanks to thanks to technology, we can we can show you what we can bring, and you know, by the end of the day, we have an amazing team, and and they're basically, it's not a very easy audience. They are not taking no for an answer. They are asking questions. Show me the proof. Explain me. Tell me how it's going to work. I don't believe in those numbers. Show me how it's work. Look. It's a, it's a very, very, very tough job because um, when you're coming from, from the point is, guys, I don't think technology can help in this kind of situation, which, which is very complex, then you need to work very hard to convince them. Mm -hmm. First of all, God, I, wanna, I have two last questions. Before I ask them, I just want to thank you. Uh, it's... What you've created is, is truly amazing. Everyone should, could check out Clue Med, which is C-L-E-W-Med.com. Check out what they're doing. Um, Gal, two things I was asking is Inspired Insider. What's been a tough point, low moment challenge that you had to really push through 
And on the flip side, what's been an especially proud moment with the journey so far? Um, what's been a tough time? So the tough time is right now, what is, what's going on right now? We have the technology. It was proven, was installed. And guys, we are here and we can do so many, st- so many kind of things. I mean, I mean, it's kind of amazing to see what is the boundary, what is the limit of technology. And right now, what we're facing right now that is happening in the U.S., that you don't have uh, the time to listen. I mean, COVID is hit very, very aggressively right now in the States, that no one have the time to listen, no one have the time to make uh, um, any progress. And given the fact that, you know, the sky is closed and you can't really fly, and healthcare providers don't allow, you know, vendors to come, and even, you know, going inside of the facility, this is, this is bad because, you know, we have worked in this solution for five years. It's ready to deploy it. We have an EOA, FDA approval. We can start shipping product, but we need to have a willing partner that come and said, yes, it's a bad time right now. Everyone is panic mode, but we need this type of technology. Mm. It's tough. It's like the yeah. very time someone needs it is when they're like, we need to wait. So um, what's been a proud moment from the journey? The proud moment, yeah, you know, when, um, we, when we started, you know, the installation here um, in Israel, we got a phone call from the two largest healthcare providers here, uh, Shiba Medical Center and Tel Aviv Medical Center. And, and we know the guys very, very well. And we stopped everything and we said, yes, we are focusing only in the US market, but let's put everything on hold. Let's help, let's create. And we had a wonderful team. We have great team here in Clue that put and work like 20 hours every day for three, uh, for almost three weeks to bring the solution And when you can see that the system is really up and running and it's helping to save lives, I was thrilled and the team was very thrilled about it. And you know, and when you're talking to the doctor, you're talking with the medical team and they're coming and said, guys, this is so amazing. Uh, This is, you know, what we wanted to to hear. That's it. We don't need more than that. Yeah. Gal, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone, check out cluemed.com. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Gal. Thank you very, very much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.